Good morning, everyone. Today we will be looking at butterfly life cycles. Well, mostly butterfly life cycles. There will be a few moths involved as well. All the photographs you will see in this slideshow are local, i.e. Scottish borders, mostly eastern borders to be more precise. It's where I get about and have been getting about now for butterflies at least this past 14 years or so. All the following forms and life stages are findable with some patients. Butterfly life cycles, as to be said, are a growing trend with me. I'm not sure where I started with this seriously. Once upon a time, it was only really the adult butterflies I was interested in, and it all slowly dawned on me over some time that there was a world beyond that, unexplored. If I could point to a catalyst for the past few years that spurred me on to study the life cycles a bit more closely, it would be the discovery of white letter hair streak, being shown the eggs of the species by Ken Haydock and Jill Mills, who over many years had studied the life cycle of the hair streak. I was immediately hooked by their enthusiasm for the life cycle of this one species. I also suddenly became aware of trees as habitats for butterflies. We will move on. The slideshow you see here are the four stages of the small copper life cycle, ova, larva, pupa, imago. Also remembering that not photographed here are the various larval stages, of which there are four, and other species, sometimes five, and those are known as instars. On to this list. I have a few lists to introduce through each section. We will look briefly at a few examples before we're going a bit more in depth, starting with ova, the egg. This list is split between static and mobile species. This is a personal list, you must remember, and it may be different for others. The static species are species where I can find the egg without the need for the adult female to show me where. Now, I'm not saying that finding any of these eggs is an easy task. You must always have some faith. After a while, you do begin to pick up unknowingly a sixth sense and finding them, finding them becomes easier. The mobile list contains species where following the female around during flight season can lead you to finding the egg of the species and also the habitat and food plant she requires and also I might add the microclimate that is suitable for the decision she makes. You'll notice after a few years that butterflies tend to lay eggs in roughly the same places each and every year given that the habitat has remained undisturbed. That is no accident. If a habitat food plant within that habitat and microclimate remains stable, then it's a case of it ain't broke, then why fix it? Just to note, speckled wood on the static list should be on the mobile list. I ran out of space to fit that one in. The photograph on the left is of purple hair streak. Last year I was sent a few eggs that had been found by Chris Stamp whilst he gathered windfall branches from under oaks in Perthshire. The idea was to raise the three eggs I received from Chris to adulthood. I managed as far as first instar cater caterpillar before losing sight of all three larvae, sadly. My first ever encounter with this species. So, I will go through a few species, just brushing the surface really, just highlighting a few of the many given I have just 40 minutes. We begin with wall brown. Not easy to find without the help of the female to show you where, so therefore I class this one as a mobile species. The egg, as with all eggs, is not easy to see, even with the help of the female. I usually wait until she has left the area, and then move in and carefully search with some magnification around the probable egg-laying areas. Sometimes you can find them straight away, and sometimes after a while, and sometimes not at all. It's all trial and error, really. The egg you can see is spotty and what looks like wee hairy bits on the on the wall of the egg. It's packed in very tightly indeed, and what you can see there is actually the head of the caterpillar. And once it breaks free, all is revealed, leaving behind a fragile glass-like eggshell. And uh, quite, quite a very small caterpillar indeed. Moving on now to small blue, very familiar species for me and considering where I live, I'm very lucky to have so many small colonies nearby on the Berkshire coast. 
I do not know all there is to know about small blue, far from it. However, this is a species that can be fun to follow through the year at all stages. This is what I consider to be a static species, as I don't really need the adults to show me where to look. I'm really only looking for kidney vetch, and among the pre-flowering and flowering buds, you are looking for tiny blue-green discs that are placed carefully, almost suspended among the hairs of the buds, as you can see here. And here we have the quintessential beginner's egg hunter species, the northern brown argus, without doubt the most popular species to re be recorded as an egg as well as an adult. The eggs are bright and white and laid along the central rib of the upper leaf of a common rock rose. Even if you are blind like me, they can be picked out at a distance. Therefore, the northern brown argus is very much on the static list. No matter the circumstances, you can look for evidence of this species wherever common rock rose grows. Best times of year to look for eggs, months of June, July, sometimes August, depending on the weather. Once the egg hatches, it can still be visible on the food plant, so it can be counted that way as well. You even may see, as illustrated, evidence of the larva having done some grazing after hatching, and then the caterpillar disappears to the rear end of the leaf on the underside. But it hides away and it's very very difficult to find them this is the only one i've ever found after many years of searching they're um, very they, they they tend to they tend to drop to the ground if you if you start searching for them so it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a lottery looking for them really The large skipper is a grassland species, more rough grassland agricultural set aside types of places. The eggs are not going to be easy to find without the help of the adult female, so a mobile species here. This egg was laid on the upper side of false brome, quite large and easily seen with the naked eye. Naked eye. While photographing this one, an ant passed over the egg and actually went in a reverse gear to inspect the egg. However, the ant was caught in two mines as it was already at full carrying capacity and decided to leave it and carry on. I did get the feeling though that the ant would be back for further investigation. A whole new section here with larva. As you may notice, the link has the the list has shrunk a bit. Finding larva of butterflies is far from easy. Larva tend to hide for good reason. Moth larva are far easier to find as there are so many species, but butterflies away from the common species can be tricky to say the least. Wall and purple hair streak highlighted in white because I've only been able to see examples of these caterpillars in captivity. The rest are in yellow I have found in the wild. On the left is the deftly designed and beautifully camouflaged small blue, which I will co cover next. Small blue caterpillars are actually far easier to look for than you may think. They usually begin looking from the second week in July, though that has been getting earlier as seasons have quickened. The early stages of the small blue life cycle are spent within the buds of the kidney vetch, but later the larva will become too, too big and end up feeding from the outside. Curled around the decaying bud, the larva is perfectly shaped and coloured to match its surroundings a theme of most caterpillars to blend in. Every once in a while, they are attended by ants. The ants see the larva as an asset that needs to be protected and will quickly come to the aid of the larva if they sense any danger. It's remarkable to watch. One July after finding this caterpillar, I deliberately brushed the vegetation for the larva sat quietly, and then seconds the larva was surrounded by ants looking for an assailant. The ants scoured the area before returning to surround the larva, hoping to be rewarded for their efforts. I'm not sure if our small blue have the ability to secrete sugar from the rear end. The ants, though, are convinced that they do. So this brightly coloured little character is a final instar small copper. Not an easy species to find in the wild, and at this stage, secretive, sensitive to vibration, 
They've been on the underside of common sorrel, sheep, sorrel or dock and can be given away at later stages by typical feeding damage. They feed in bursts rather than constantly and in between times just sit tightly against the leaf central vein and um, pretty much motionless. It can develop very quickly and uh, two or three broods a season. The very different large white is not quite so common as it used to be due to persecution, however, every once in a while they can gather in fair numbers. The scourge of the cabbage patch are a wondrous sight to see in spring, the flapping white flags against a clear blue sky. Away from garden or commercial brassica patches, they can be difficult to find in wild cabbage species. I once found a number of large white larvae tucking into a large sea kale growing on the shingle of the beach by the sea. Very tough old chew. Large white though can break those tough fibres down and with the numbers they can render anything to a pulp as long as it's cabbagey in nature. Finally for the larval section we have Painted Lady, the only butterfly larva you will find on thistle really. Creeping thistle and spear thistle are the most popular places to look. In good years thistle patches can be quickly devastated by them. They leave behind a debris of frass and webbing that is unmistakable. 2019 obviously was a good year to go looking for them. 2020, 21, not so much. Painted Lady years on the scale of 2019 are a bit of a rarity. And now to pupa. As you can see, once again, my list shrinketh even further. There's some work to do with pupa. Uh, finding them not quite so easy. A work in progress, shall we say. On the left is a beautifully vibrant red admiral can be found suspended among nettles encased in the nettle tents that they build themselves. They, they kind of lop the top off the nettle, the nettle falls over and then they sew it all together with silk. It's very clever indeed. So nettle butterflies in general are the most obvious places to look for signs of pupa. Peacock and small tortoiseshell are common enough. Finding the pupa though, well, it can be done, but takes some time and know-how. After reaching the point of pupation, caterpillars tend to wander. They can wander quite far from the food plant, and that is what makes life difficult for the hunter. And that is the whole point of the wander. The peacock here is a vivid, vivid surely he couldn't miss that yellow. And the tortoiseshells are much more subdued, though nonetheless beautiful. You can see this series were all homegrown and rescued from the strimming police who have an aversion to nettles. Finally, for this section, a much smaller than this appears to be small copper pupa, wrapped tightly inside and only a few days away from emergence. The colours showing through the pupa are quite something to see. I only saw this for the first time this year after raising a single small copper from an egg. In the wild, the pupa would be very, very difficult to find indeed without a hell of a lot of field work or accident, which can happen more often than not. Yes, some I look for deliberately as part of my annual routine. Most though are incidental. You cannot help finding moth caterpillars every once in a while. Eggs are a rarity unless they are very common species and pupa are found only if I ever dig over the garden, which is never. <laughs> this, this pus moth was a stumbled into surprise by the banks of the Wittada, along with several of its odd pals. It was fascinated by its appearance, a big caterpillar wearing a very scary onesie. The diversity of moth larvae could keep you going for many years. Each year I look for these three species in particular along the Berkshire coast. They're all common species at a very, very local level. The blackneck and the dew moth are exceptionally scarce beyond a few miles of Berkshire coastline. Blackneck grazes wood vetch, the drinker coastal grasslands, and the dew moth prefers crusty lichen plastered to the sea sprayed boulders. This is, as most of you might know, an elephant hawk moth larva. Up until last year, I had never seen one. 
2020 was quite an unusual year as suddenly many elephants started popping up. They feed on willow herbs, mostly rosebud willow herb. Once they reach maturity, they are very large and dark and against the willow herb are very, very visible. I was seeing lots and so were others. I knew just how beautiful the moth is and decided to take one into captivity to see out the life cycle. I fed the elephant night and day, a voracious appetite, and in case you were wondering, it pooped like an elephant as well. Never seen anything like it. The large caterpillar began to wander and formed finally, after a good few days, this magnificent pupa. It was time for overwintering. I kept it in the fridge and checked progress once or twice during the winter period. All appeared to be fine until the spring came around. I removed the pupa from the fridge and noted straight away its lack of movement. I presumed that it had died. I didn't give up though, kept a hold of it. Weeks went by and suddenly one morning I happened to glance at it and saw this. It was as if it had been cracked open like a boiled egg. There was absolutely no evidence that a moth had emerged and this was very untypical of a moth emergence. I kept the doors closed and windows shut and waited, waited. I meanwhile asked the experts a few of whom suggested parasitism. A few days passed and nothing when suddenly I could hear a commotion by the window. Something big was trying to get out. May I present the elephant hunter, Amblyjopa proteus, a very large and devilishly beautiful ignoyment that specialises on elephant hawk moths. It figures that if the elephant has a good year, the ichnoyman has a good year to follow. All swings and roundabouts. I say Amblyjopa proteus free to do as to what he does. Thankfully, there are plenty more elephants out there. Now for the more in-depth section, looking at just three species, white letter hair streak, orange tip, and hummingbird hawk moth. I have learned since 2017 that I can look for all stages of the white letter hair streak all year round, eggs through winter, larvae through early spring, pupae through midsummer, and adults through July and into August then, back to eggs and so on and so on. It's all really about time and how much time you spend and then spending that time well rather than wasting it looking in the wrong places. The butterfly is an elm specialist, so elm is where you are going to find evidence of all the life stages. No two elm are the same though. The butterflies choose the best placed elms for territorial display, males and egg laying, obviously females, so it can mean that you have to judge for yourself which elms would suit hair streaks when looking for eggs to save through winter. Now I might add here, I'm actually rubbish at looking for white letter eggs. I found a few, but not as many as I would like considering the time I've spent, even when looking in the right place, I failed to see them. Looking for larva is very tricky and looking for signs of feeding damage is key to it. The larva feed initially inside the buds of the elm after hatching sometime in late February, March. They eventually become visible later, however, will change colour upon each instar to mimic the changes of the trees, flowers, seed pods and foliage. You can see signs of typical damage to seed pods here. So this is a good indication that there are white letters at work. On the left hand side on this little branch you can see two hatched eggs where the arrows are pointing just, just, just to make that clear. Those are two hatched eggs so the caterpillars will be dispatched somewhere in those seed pods and drooping flower heads. I, I couldn't find them but I'm, I'm pretty sure they were there somewhere. And here is one of one of those caterpillars I was looking for, which I found this year. So later they move on to the foliage where leaf damage can be seen. A word of caution, though elm has many grazing insects, leaf damage can be caused by a myriad of miscellaneous insects. I have trouble with it, but my tip is, if there's lots of damage in one area of the elm, 
and it's a good place to look as most insects use the best positions on an elm for its microclimate. The more damage in one area, the better. It's also good practice to look at elm tops, look for a raggedy leaved appearance. This may be down to just this may not be down to just white letter history, but it may prove that there is lots of insect activity. Lots of damage, as I say, signifies a good tree. I have searched for white letter without reply in places where the elm tops are completely intact, no feeding damage at all. It's all to do with those climate pockets. Some places are just a bit more sheltered than others. You can see this effect with many species other than white letter. Each season that passes opens up new ground. Uh, plant climate pockets are expanding and so, so are the corridors that the butterflies can use. This is my own theory having seen the expansion of habits of many new or returning species to the Scottish borders especially. Just as a note here for scale, this is a fully grown Pineland star white light hair streak. And for scale, you can see on the left hand side, uh, on the left hand side, you can see a little um, tree hopper nymph. And on the right hand side, on the branch, on the head side of the white letter hair streak, you can see a hatched egg, which it's the caterpillar would have come from a few months before. So it's, it grows quite a bit in a short period of time. Once the larval stage is completed, it's time to pupate. The white letter pupa was not something I thought I could ever find, so didn't really ever take finding it very seriously until this year when I got so bored waiting for adults to appear that I accidentally found a white letter pupa. By turning over elm leaves, wherever I saw lots of feeding damage, I was a bit surprised to get so lucky. I then followed the exact strategy of looking for feeding damage and overturned leaves, revealing a feather five pupa at the beginning of July. They are found along the central rib and are fastened quite tightly like Gulliver was by the Lilliputians. I described my strategy on social media, hoping that a few of the determined might have a go themselves, not really expecting anything. When the very next day I received an email from Charlotte K.V. Wilcox, who had found one pupa along with photographic evidence after a three hour search at hair stains near Jedburgh. An amazing find. As for the six I found, I made repeated visits to monitor progress and recorded that four out of the six pupa were successful. This is one of the four survivors, a female preparing for the ultimate life stage as Imigo. The orange tip. Orange tip at all stages is one of the easiest of species to study as the butterfly at the moment is a common species almost anywhere. It's an easy species to raise from scratch yourself and very worthwhile doing to get some idea of what it takes to be able to complete so many radical changes of, changes of form in one lifetime. It begins with an egg. When freshly laid among the flowering head of garlic mustard or cuckoo flower, it's white turning orange a few days later, distinguishing it from the similar green veined white. Though it has to be said, the green veined white will lay its eggs on the leaves of garlic mustard or cuckoo flower if it does at all, rather than on the stems, on the flowering stem of the, of the plant. So they, they kind of they lay their eggs in different places so they can be distinguished that way as well. The caterpillar hatches and immediately begins to start whittling down those seed pods. They are eating machines and take very few breaks and very quickly reach a mammoth size, ending up looking like a stripe of toothpaste on the seed pod. When fully grown, they will eat the seed pods, the stalk, the leaves, anything remotely edible in fact. After a while at fully grown, the caterpillar becomes lethargic and begins the great wander. This wandering is the most difficult stage to monitor as the caterpillar is extremely fussy about where it sets up its pupa. Once it does settle, it will weave a vast web of silk around the twig from top to bottom and then fasten itself by the cremaster to the branch or stem. 
it will now wrestle itself into its winter sleeping bag. Looks like a very painful experience, to be honest. Who knows? It goes on for a good while, then slowly but surely the change completes to lime green winter quarter that gradually turns a far more wintry brown to match the dead vegetation around it. The orange tip will now sit tight for many months through late summer, autumn, winter and early spring before finally waking up. The colour begins to return and get brighter with time. By late April and the butterfly can be seen, in this case a male orange tip can be seen clearly through the pupil case walls. The cycle completed, but not quite. The emerging butterfly must work, work quickly to pump up its wings, dry out and unfurl and fuse its proboscis. Failure to do any of these will lead to disaster. Each and every orange tip I see these days, I now understand completely what a miracle they are to survive the many, many upheavals and potential pitfalls of a life cycle. And finally today, it's not a butterfly, but a moth to finish with. No ordinary moth will do. The hummingbird hawk moth is the flying machine, not much like it in the world of Lepidoptera. Certainly one of the most spectacular insects running my way through summer. I see them irreg irregularly for short spells as I excitedly chase them up and down the cliff, cliff sides uh, of the Berkshire coast, mostly where I see them. A few years ago, I thought it might be an idea to raise one from a wild egg. Finding a wild egg, though, would not be so easy. So I started on the coastline looking at bed straws. The ladies' bed straw, Gallium verum in particular. I also looked at the very common Gallium apparine, better known by several names locally, Sticky Willy. I couldn't find a thing in short, but I did find by accident a female egg laying, and that is how I found the egg. They are actually quite visible eggs, and I think could be found with patience. I took the egg home and placed it in a small box and a very large amount of sticky willy. Too much. First mistake. The egg hatched very quickly and I lost the caterpillar in a jungle of sticky willy. It was a few days before I was able to detect frass in the bottom of the box, signifying that at least the caterpillar was still alive at least. When the caterpillar finally became visible to my eye, it grew and grew at a ridiculously quick rate. The hummer is a hungry beast, as I was able to successfully weed my garden of sticky willy over the period it remained in larval form. It reached a bloated size eventually and began the great wander, though not as far, not as much of a wanderer as the orange tip, for example. The hummingbird drew a few of the sticky willy plants together with silk into a very rough cocoon and settled down to pupae. I left it alone and didn't look again for a week. I was busy at work at the time and missed the emergence of the beast. So to say I was gobsmacked to come home and see this sitting in the bottom of the box is an understatement. I'd seen this species up close before, but to see a fresh one sitting like this was breathtaking. I released the Hummer out into the sun again where it belongs a few hours after a final photo shoot. I must stress at this point that I can't say that I would openly encourage anyone to take wild ovae, larvae or pupae home to raise for fun or wonder. The question would always be for me, did you learn anything or can anything be learned from the experience? That's the key to it. I do know that a few have been raising peacock and tortoise shell lately, saving those caterpillars and eggs from strimmers. The same with orange tip and recently Chris Stamp and a few others have been rescuing purple hair streak that have become detached from the oak and winter storms with some fantastic success and much, much more importantly, imparting knowledge of the life cycle. And that is all good news. An appreciation of not just the fluttery colourful life of a butterfly or moth, but the whole cycle from beginning to never ending. So on to Emigo, just a short section really. There's not much really to say about the 
Well, there is. There's probably a whole slide shows worth of things this I could say about Emigo, but just a few slides. The reward of a long winter can be first butterfly of spring, a comma perhaps. It's quite often a comma these days. These are changed days. We have in the Scottish borders gained many new returning species this past 20 years. Almost all insect groups are on the move northwards. How far north can you go on an island? That remains to be seen. We tend to look for the perfect specimens or the aberrations, colour forms and subspecies, summer forms, etc, etc. It's not the case that if you see one comma, you have seen them all. Far from it. We have locally very few local subspecies where butterflies are concerned, but the few we do have are gems. The Northern Brown Argus being the most famous of them all with its bright white forewing spots. As for summer forms or seasonal forms, again, I have, have to look for the comma summer form pictured left as a prime example of what was once a, rari a rarity up here in Scotland. I have a reasonable collection of photographs of these aberrant forms and always like to add new ones each season. The variety and diversity is always something that you don't see unless you really look closely. And you just never know what you're going to see from one year to the next or one season to the next. So each and every butterfly to me looks better than the next. So photographing them is pretty much a luxury. Before thanking you all for listening, I must point you all in the direction of this book by Peter Eels. It is without any doubt the most in-depth look at butterfly life cycles there is out there with many years of work packed in. Some of that work done up here in Scotland with a Scottish viewpoint, a rare thing these days. I met Pete on a few occasions on his research for the book on the Berwickshire coast as he studied the life cycle of the Northern Brown Argus. If you have any questions for me after this slideshow, I can be reached at the email on the last slide. Thank you. On a final note, and probably bolted on to the end in truth, is that the point of this slideshow and talk is to convince you somehow that there is far more to butterflies than meets the eye. I can only hope to inspire a few of you to look at not just the colourful crescendo that the butterfly becomes, but also where it has been to get to that ultimate stage, through all stages of a perilous journey. There is so much detail out there to share about butterfly life cycles that the slideshow could have been weeks long rather than 40 minutes. Adult behaviour, mating rituals, courtship displays, associate plants, associate insects, parasitoids, which I have a lot of work to do on, most parasites being host-specific, host like a brief look at Amblyopa proteus, for example etc etc. Also I forget about the importance now of aphids in the life cycle which is all new to me and still to be studied. As for recording life stages I advise you to try to photograph anything you find to be determined or verified. Any photograph of any quality is better than nothing at all. If I think something needs investigating further I investigate further and ask questions. I also advise using iRecord if you have some small tortoiseshell caterpillars to record, for example, enter small tortoiseshell in the species box. And from the drop down menu, select the life stage. Um, but like I say, also get as much detail into a record as you can overall. Details help hugely in verification of records. And there's the iRecord box there. And the drop down box for the, the, the life stage. At this time of year, I'm looking just now for the evidence of white letter hair streak in its egg form or on elm, and a good few out there about the Scottish borders looking for purple hair streak in its egg form. We have had some success with white letter already this late season, but nothing as yet has shown for purple, purple hair streak. Finding evidence of eggs, of course, will be rock solid evidence of breeding, more so than finding any adults. There are three links above to useful websites. The East Branch website, packed full of information. The Facebook East Scottish Butterflies group page, a great place to share any sightings or to get IDs. But do note, it's not a substitute for recording. 
And finally, UK Butterflies website, a butterfly maker, everything on this site you could ever want to know. Thank you all for listening, and thank you to Claudia and Natalie for keeping us well informed and organised for this weekend's conference. Well done to all. <laughs>